Good afternoon, everyone. It is Thursday, April 8th at 2 p.m. This is Senate Education. We apologize for the late start. Uh, we had a uh, scheduling um, misunderstanding on our end. As we know, the House has sent us uh, two bills, one of which we've been working on, which is this uh, uh, school construction bill. The other bill that they sent us is on community schools, a pilot project, pilot program that would allow our schools to uh, access dollars, ESSER dollars, uh, and put a community school director in schools to help um, to help really provide the, the, the resources that so many of our students need. So uh, I'm not sure whose phone is ringing, but Mr. Francis, if you wouldn't mind turning that off. Hi, Dan. So, thank you. Uh, I think- uh, Hang on one sec, I get up. Going to- Okay, go ahead, sorry. We're going to start with uh, uh, Mr. Racine, who is joining us. Okay. Um, Great to see you, Doug. Thanks for joining us. Uh, appreciate your patience. Uh, as you know, we are talking about community schools, something that you're very interested in, and uh, looking forward to hearing from you. So the floor is yours. Great. Well, thank you. And um, uh, for the, your record, uh, Doug Racine, uh, former Secretary of Agency of Human Services, former Lieutenant Governor, and seven-term uh, member of the, uh, the Senate. Uh, including uh, time on the Health and Welfare uh, Committee with Senator uh, Lyons. And uh, I also appreciate the fact that as we go into this issue, uh, H 106, it seems we have a quorum of the Health and Welfare Committee uh, with us today as, as well. So I think that's, that's really helpful because I see H 106 as being uh, as much a, a human services issue uh, and perhaps even more so uh, than an education uh, issue. Um, as I really appreciated uh, listening in with Secretary French. Uh, a lot of what he said is very consistent with uh, the thinking that uh, is behind uh, H-106 Community Schools Bill. Uh, a couple of points that he made is we really need systems built around, uh, around our schools and our, and our students uh, to help with the issues that are barriers to children getting good education. And he talked at the end of his remarks a lot about equal opportunity and the state's responsibility. And I, I think we all understand right now and see that uh, equal opportunity is not something uh, that exists throughout the state of Vermont. And primarily uh, children uh, who have come from uh, low income uh, homes, poverty, uh, uh, homes with a lot of poverty and a lot of dysfunction. Uh, those are the kids who we are failing and giving uh, an, an opportunity uh, for, uh, for a good education. Uh, H-106 to me could be one of the most significant pieces of legislation passed this year outside of the COVID legislation uh, in that it's an opportunity to build back better, which I think is the, the mantra coming out of just about everybody uh, in state government and outside of state government uh, as well. Uh, to me, it's an opportunity to make sure that uh, we are using our schools and our human services effectively uh, to help every child succeed and have that opportunity for the American dream that, that I enjoyed uh, growing up. And I think most of us uh, here uh, have enjoyed. Uh, when I was secretary of the Agency of Human Services, it was painfully obvious to me, and it was probably just as obvious when I was serving uh, in the Senate, uh, that um, poverty is related to most of the issues that the Agency of Human Services uh, deals with. Uh, certainly uh, DCF, uh, but also corrections. I think it's well over 90% of those folks incarcerated do not have a high school diploma, uh, which tells us something about the lasting, some of the lasting impacts of poverty if we aren't, if we aren't dealing with it. Um, but it's also the achievement gap or the opportunity gap. It's all been called both things uh, over time. Uh, we use different words at different, different times. Uh, but that's, um, that achievement gap has existed or since we started doing, uh, or it's been recognized since we started doing standardized testing. Mm. It's the case, every secretary or commissioner of education talks about uh, the need to help those kids who are living in poverty, those who are, um, the measure we use, those who are eligible for free and reduced uh, lunches. Um, but again, in my experience is the mental, the mental health issues, the achievement gap issues, a lot of special ed costs are, are related to poverty. And then later on in life, uh, substance abuse problems, uh, the uh, the poor 
poor physical health, our Medicaid budget, uh, some child abuse, it goes on and on and on. And the way to get at prevention of a lot of these problems is to help kids um, succeed in school. And for kids to succeed in school, they need the supports that H106 uh, promises them. Uh, I don't know how much you've heard from experts about uh, the community schools concept, uh, but uh, it is an opportunity to bring the services uh, that should be available to kids into the school building so they're readily accessible. And Senator Campion, you pointed out that I've been interested in this. Uh, I was there at, um, helping uh, uh, Sue McGuire as much as I possibly could uh, down in the Molly Stark Elementary School in, uh, in your community of Bennington. Um, but building that very model, uh, bringing in all sorts of services, and she did it on her own. There wasn't anybody at the state uh, helping her, um, or nobody's the, uh, the, then the Department of Education. She was pulling it all together in a very entrepreneurial way. But she recognized that uh, kids needed a lot, of, uh, a lot of additional supports if she was going to be successful in helping them get, uh, get a good education. And all of these issues have become even more apparent and more severe uh, with the pandemic. Lots of studies out there right now. I read one just the other day that came from McKinsey, which is a large uh, management uh, 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 company uh, that uh, talks about the how much uh, students have lost in their learning uh, since the pandemic began. And it's obviously worse for those kids who are living in poverty and it takes on all the racial uh, issues uh, as well uh, that uh, other areas of the country uh, experience uh, even more than we do. I think there are a lot of good reasons to support this bill, which I hope you will, obviously. Uh, it's, um, an, as I said, it's an opportunity to address the lasting impacts of poverty, those things that get in the way. Uh, even if uh, um, President Biden is successful in reducing childhood poverty by 50%, uh, which is an admirable goal, there's still the 50% that uh, are gonna be living in poverty and those who have started in poverty are gonna experience some of those lasting impacts of, um, of the childhood traumas that can get in the way. Um, it's an opportunity uh, for a better provision of Agency of Human Services programs. As former secretary, uh, I see this uh, as an opportunity to bring a lot of human services programs into the, into the schools where uh, they are most needed. I mean, the programs aimed at children are by and large offered outside of the schools. Well, where do you get, where can you get this, the children uh, um, most easily? Where can you get at them? It's obviously uh, in, in the schools. Uh, so I see an opportunity for better provision, more effectiveness uh, of those services, and uh, frankly, uh, more cost effectiveness of, of those services uh, as well. Uh, I see, I, the vision I see in H106 is a central place for, uh, for uh, services. You know, the last, uh, since last March, a lot of state uh, employees uh, in the Agency of Human Services, particularly in the economic services arena, have been operating out of their homes. There's no reason why they can't be operating out of their schools. And when parents dropping their kids off at school, uh, picking their kids up at school, uh, or coming to the school for teacher meetings, they could be uh, filling out their forms and meeting with their case managers and um, getting the services there, particularly in rural areas where transportation is, uh, is a major issue uh, for people to, to receive uh, services. Uh, it allows us to tear down silos. If you build programs or try to build programs around the children rather than for bureaucratic convenience, uh, the, the, the school is an ideal place to bring all the various people who are involved in a child's, uh, a child's life, uh, the parents, uh, the providers, uh, the therapists and everyone else associated, bring them all together uh, in, in one place. The other thing I really like about this is the, uh, the op other opportunities that are ancillary, uh, but I think have tremendous um, uh, promise uh, using our community assets, uh, our school buildings uh, for uh, other services behind, besides just education. And as we're seeing a lot of pressure to close smaller rural schools, uh, here's an opportunity to keep those schools open, uh, even though the perhaps the, the number of students uh, might be declining, uh, the state could actually pay rent to the schools, school districts to use those buildings for the provision of uh, various uh, services. You could cut down on the number of offices needed for that state uses in their state office buildings 
And instead of paying the money uh, for the rent, as, as we do in a lot of those buildings, uh, we could be paying school districts as a way of keeping those, those school buildings open. Uh, we talk a lot about broadband and attracting young families into Vermont and live in our rural areas. They aren't coming if they don't have, uh, if there aren't schools uh, in their communities for their kids. You aren't gonna get somebody to move into a town uh, even if it's got great broadband to work online uh, all over, you know, connecting with people all over the world, if every morning they put their six and seven year old children on a school bus for an hour, uh, it's just not going to happen. So let's let's use this as an opportunity uh, to find more creative and entrepreneurial ways to keep our schools, uh, our small schools uh, viable. Uh, but it's a it's a it's an idea that works uh, in ur in the more urbanized areas of the state as well as the more uh, rural uh, areas. Uh, I think it recognizes that, at um, the same time, it recognizes that we've been, and I think Secretary French talked about this, uh, we've been providing education for essentially the same way for, for several generations now. Uh, it's, it's not working as, as well as it should. Uh, this is an opportunity to sort of re envision how education is provided. Uh, it's an opportunity to, to be have our schools, uh, our school systems be more adaptive. Um, not only um, do I have a political and government background, I have a business background. And I got to tell you, and I think anybody who's been in business knows if you aren't adapting to, to changes uh, going on around you in technology uh, and knowledge, uh, you aren't going to survive. And we have not been very adaptive in how we provide uh, services to our children in our schools or in our, in our human services, uh, services programs. I have a few suggestions on the bill, which I think is a good bill uh, as it is, but I think there are a few things that could be done to make it even stronger and reflect some of the ideas that I just, I just talked about. Uh, one of the things that um, occurred to me while Secretary French was talking with you uh, was uh, the, the bill is aimed at either school, individual schools or school districts. And you might consider make, aiming this at school districts to build those kinds of systems that he was talking about uh, that would, um, instead of just aiming it at one school with a principal that, as he, rec as he knows, come, uh, or he recognized, uh, can come and go uh, over time, uh, building it into the system of a larger administrative uh, unit, I think would be, could be an improvement uh, in that bill. Uh, and make it uh, more likely, make it more likely to uh, succeed. Uh, he talked about multi-tiered support systems. I, I kind of like that idea. It sounds kind of bureaucratic, but uh, I think it reflects the reality of what is needed in our schools. The other thing I would recommend, and I, I did with the House Committee, and they sort of ran out of time with crossover deadline, uh, but um, I think there needs to be a very clear and specific link in this legislation to the Agency of Human Services. Uh, as I said, I think this is primarily a human services bill. We're talking about the mental health services that are needed, uh, some of the economic services that are needed, the physical health services that's, that kids need to succeed. Those are all in the, uh, they're in the, uh, seeing uh, Senator Lyons nodding her head. They're all in the, <laughs> the purview of the, uh, uh, the um, Committee on Health and Welfare. So I think a, a really clear link to that, make them part of the planning process, part of the grant making process, uh, it, I, there are great opportunities there. Uh, you know, the state signs contracts every year with our, our local mental health agencies, for example. There's no reason why the state couldn't write into those contracts that some of the services they are, that the state's paying for will be provided in our school buildings uh, directly to, uh, to the kids in those schools. The, the employees of the mental health agencies could be in small schools, they could be rotating from school to school in, within a district, or they could, in some of our larger schools, they could just be embedded uh, inside that school system. Right now, teachers who are encountering uh, kids with uh, some mental health issues might hear, well, uh, it's gonna leave every Wednesday afternoon for mental health counseling uh, down in Burlington or Rutland or Bennington or, or where have you. Uh, having those services right there in the schools, having that be an expectation to, uh, of the contracts uh, with our mental health agencies is one possibility, but to explore those possibilities, I think there needs to be a, a very clear connection and responsibility uh, for the agency of education to be working with the agency of, of human services. And I even have a suggestion for you. Um, a bill that passed a couple of years ago uh, created a director of trauma prevention and resilience development 
in the uh, agency, yes, <laughs> Senator Lyons, uh, within the secretary's office in the Agency of Human Services. And it talks about things like the responsibilities to collaborate with both community and state partners, including the Agency of Education. Um, it's right, you know, it's right there that um, uh, that connection is envisioned uh, in that trauma coordinator. So just uh, in the sub B, the director shall add it as another one that that, sh that person shall coordinate within the agency of edu the people in the agency of education uh, to put these plans together and help school districts realize the full potential of our human services uh, programs. Um, you might also, um, sort of a side thought here, there might even be an agency of uh, administration uh, link as well. If you start thinking about the possibilities of using our schools uh, as community hubs, community centers, not just for education, human services, but there's no reason why there couldn't be circuit riders out of the Department of Motor Vehicles to help people get their licenses uh, in, a, in an unused uh, room in a, in a school building. Um, they could bring their cameras and all of the, their computers in and provide services closer to people in Vermont, rather than having to stand in line for two hours at the, Depar at the Department of Motor Vehicles uh, in, in, in Montpelier. Another thing I think is really important, and Secretary French uh, actually mentioned this, while not in response or connection with this bill, uh, he asked that, uh, you know, he says, we're, we're staffed okay, but don't ask us to do anything new. H106 is something new. When you look at what's required, they've got to put plans together, they've got to put grant applications together, they've got to evaluate grant applications, they've got to monitor the grants, they've got to write reports. That can't be done by the Secretary of Education. I think a dedicated position would be really important. He might come back at you and say, oh, he doesn't need it, he'll fit it in, he'll figure out how to do it. Uh, because having worked uh, in the executive branch, that's what, uh, you, that's what secretaries and commissioners hear. When, when somebody in the legislature says, can you do this without any new positions? They say, we're, we were told, and I was one of the we, uh, sure we can do it without any new positions. We'll figure it out. It's not real. And for this to work effectively, if you want the, the, this to be an effective program, I believe there needs to be a position created. You can create a temporary position. This is a three-year demonstration program. Create a temporary position, uh, but, but don't just hand it to the secretary and say, you figure it out because uh, without a dedicated person on this, it's not going to, uh, to be uh, uh, successful. The other thing is, if I don't know who else is listening in on this, but it, you can't put this in legislation, but it needs to be talked about. Uh, this will not happen successfully without the active uh, leadership of our school boards, our superintendents, and our principals. And uh, Senator Campion, I think you know what happened uh, down in Molly Stark, it was the principal who, who made this happen. She was absolutely committed to making, uh, making it happen. Uh, but, so there definitely needs to be a way to reach out to uh, the associations of school boards, superintendents, and principals uh, to find ways to get them fully on board uh, so that they can make this happen. Because sadly, uh, I've encountered uh, uh, some uh, uh, around the state, and for many years I traveled around the state and I visited a lot of schools, I encountered a lot of uh, administrators at least 10 years ago who quite bluntly said, these issues are not school issues. They don't, they don't want anything to do with it. They just said, we're here to teach the ABCs and what happens outside the school uh, is outside the school. It's not with it, not our responsibility. Uh, I once had a uh, superintendent suggest to me that so long as the dropout rate in their school was below the state average, that was acceptable. Uh, ignoring the couple of dozen of kids who dropped out every year as so, well, just as long as you know, our statistics are good. Uh, so, you know, that's not, the, that's, that's not the kind of leadership that we need to make something like this uh, very effective. And the last thing, and I'll, I'll stop, uh, is uh, when the bill was originally drafted, it used the education fund. And uh, I suggested, and I think others suggested that we try to use some of the federal money uh, that's out there right now uh, there's a temptation to use uh, the education fund um, as a way of avoiding using general fund money. And that's been done a whole lot over the years. And uh, I think it's been overdone, quite frankly. And uh, I will claim my share of credit for it because I was there when a lot of these things that were, were shifted. Uh, but these are, these are human services issues. These are the mental health issues that kids are facing, the physical health uh, issues. Uh, the burden should not be placed on property tax 
uh, payers who, uh, when they feel that kind of direct pressure, are pushing school districts to cut uh, these kinds of services. So I think it's important for uh, the legislature and the governor, if, you're, if, if this bill is to be backed on similar bills, is to put the responsibility on uh, human, the Agency of Human Services and the funding uh, that comes through the general fund and, and you know, other state uh, taxes, but not, but not the property tax. So anyway, I'll, I'll just end by saying, I think it's a great bill. It's very exciting. I think it's a, it, it creates the possibility of providing education and human services uh, more effectively, modernize the management of these programs of our, of our schools. Uh, and in the bottom line, will be much more effective in helping our kids uh, achieve that, uh, that promise of the American dream. I thank you for listening. All right, thank you. And if you wouldn't mind forwarding that testimony to our committee assistant, that would be really helpful, Senator. Uh, I would, I'll be happy to write it because I just talk. Uh, so uh, yes, I, I, I talk from you. notes, so I will. I will try to write it up as I uh, be true to what I just said to you. Yeah, thank you. I'm wondering. So, I mean, again, it's a demonstration program. Two things are coming to my mind, and this is where Sue McGuire from Molly Stark will also be helpful. You know, how do we measure whether or not this was successful? You know, we've been talking a lot about, you know, these are these are great ideas. How do we look back and say, you know, we met certain certain goals, whatever they might be? And then how does this not end up on the, you know, again, it's it's a pilot program. So we're trying to prove that this kind of idea works. Uh, I appreciate what you said about federal funds, but federal funds are going to quickly run out at the end of these three years. So why do it if we know that there is no additional funding after three years? Why go through this, this process, if you will? Just to, to, I mean, I feel like in a way, are we yeah. setting people up for disappointment? Uh, we often do that. I was never <laughs> a fan of, dem when I was secretary, I was never a fan of, of demonstration projects and, and pilot programs for just that reason. Right. And I often use that if I, if I ever win the lottery, uh, I wanted to set up what I call the year four uh, foundation, which is after th uh, three years of foundation funding and the foundations go away, yes. uh, help them pay for it in the year four, five, and six, and so on. Uh, it's a fair question. Uh, first, I, I think there's some folks who are really expert uh, in uh, in this concept, um, the House Committee uh, heard from many of them, so you could check with um, with some of them. Uh, but there's something called the Learning Policy Institute out there that has done research on this uh, and talks about the effectiveness and has looked at the uh, the, the outcomes from uh, these programs in other school districts. Uh, and it might be worthwhile. Uh, to engage with one of them, uh, the legislature engaged. So you're doing your own independent review of this, uh, but put somebody like this on, under a, a small contract to uh, to set some parameters and that you can measure by to just to make your own determination after one or two or three years whether uh, this has been effective. As far as uh, funding goes, um, I can't. I wouldn't guarantee this as a former secretary, uh, but I think. The agency could actually save money by providing services uh, in these ways. Uh, it's an opportunity. Um, this gets into a, a, a bigger issue uh, that I've been beating on for uh, years, as Senator Lyons knows, because she's listened to me uh, many times talk about this. Uh, but the Agency of Human Services is not structured in an, or not structured and managed in an efficient way. It's managed through in silos. And every program is works in its silo, mm -hmm. uh, and they may work, be very effective in providing their individual services, but they don't fit together very effectively. Uh, somebody working with a reach-up client, for example, uh, does not know whether that per whether that person or that, that members of that person's family are receiving mental health services. So they never can really or substance abuse services, or there's some a family member in corrections. Because the computers don't talk to each other, we don't build our services around uh, around individuals and families. We build our services, uh, what I could say, for bureaucratic convenience. Uh, and I think there's potential for tremendous savings. And by re-envisioning how we provide services and providing some of those services in our schools, and building teams around uh, around uh, those individuals who are receiving services. I think we could be more effective and more efficient. It's 
not a great answer for you, Senator, because- No, but no, I appreciate the honesty yeah. and, and yeah. you know, I, it, we'll, we'll dig into this a little bit more. I'm just yeah. looking at our, our clock and we would love to have you continue, but uh, I, any pressing questions for Senator Racine or comments before we move on? Uh, we have until about 3.45 at the latest to take this up. Senator Lyons. Yeah, I, I can't resist making a comment, but um, you know, as usual, I agree with, with um, Lieutenant Governor, Senator. Secretary, <laughs> whatever, hey you. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, well, you know, and the, the reason that we put the trauma position into the secretary's office yeah. in the first place was to, was to build a trauma-informed culture within the agency. And right. that is one of the reasons why I actually asked the question of the secretary today about building a trauma-informed culture in schools, um, a, a very a somewhat satisfactory, but not completely satisfactory answer. But, and then the other position you mentioned, which is our chief prevention officer in the uh, office of the administration, in the governor's office, is, uh, is someone who does work to build, uh, to break down silos. And so I couldn't agree with you more, but it, we all understand that when we invest in prevention, we understand the difficulty of measuring the, the benefit. And it takes years to do that. So having a short-term pilot program may not be the, provide the benefit that we would like, but something has to happen. I think you're absolutely right. Something has to happen. Um, I do have a question for you, actually. So uh, kind of a paradox, because uh, you mentioned um, not using education resources, but it is the responsibility of schools to provide that human culture for student su success. So. I know there are tensions around this all the time and we hear about it all the time. Schools are not the place for, or can't do all of the mental health and social service work that we would like. And yet we demand that they pay for it. So that, that, that's the paradox, that's all. I'm not sure I have much of a uh, response to that because- no, no, you don't have to. <laughs> no, but, 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 but you're right. Um, but What's happened with uh, Act 60 is what uh, the opponents of Act 60 said at the time, which is once the state gets its hands on the property tax, it will be used for uh, other, other services as well. Uh, and it drives up the property, it's driving up our property tax, which is even though it's income based for a lot of people, it's still a, a regressive tax. And it's a tax when, the, when, when state government assigns more responsibilities to our school districts, um, it's doing so without taking responsibility for the tax increase that goes along with it. And it just shifts it to the local level. And I think we all know, because we all go to our school board meetings and we all hear from our school boards uh, uh, constantly that they are under incredible pressure to keep property taxes uh, uh, down. And what happens is a lot of programs for low income kids get cut in, in the process. So I think it's I think it's incumbent upon state government to provide the funding for those services that are really human services, and I'm thinking mostly uh, mostly uh, in the mental uh, health arena and in, and the health arena. You are, and I understand that you know a child with a toothache is not going to get a, be able to learn anything that particular day, and if there's a dentist on that comes by the school once a week, that's going to be uh, that's going to be really helpful. But that's not an education service. So I, I, it is a paradox, Senator. I just um, uh, I just feel that uh, there uh, needs to be uh, some recognition that these are these are programs that uh, should be funded through the Agency of Human Services. Uh, so, and I couldn't agree with you more, but we need to be able to integrate those without um, detracting from all of the community services that we're facing right now as well. It's just a really big area of, it's, of concern. It's a, it's a tough, tough area. Most of yeah. what the Agency of Human Services and its partners do is deal with people in crisis. We do not do a whole lot in the area of prevention. Yeah. And that's especially true over the years in children's uh, mental health services. 
Uh, we, you know, when the child's in, in crisis, then their service is available, but we haven't put a whole lot into prevention. And, you know, look at the discussion of mental health right now. What's, what are we talking about most is building another very expensive to build an expensive to operate state hospital for 50 or extension of it for 50 people. Uh, and that takes money away from the prevention of get people or uh, prevention programs that keep people out of the state hospital. We're always spending money on the crisis and not on the prevention. So this is, it's hard to make investments. Governor Snelling way back when said, we don't have enough money in the budget to prevent all the problems and save all the money that prevention could, could, uh, could give us. But um, uh, I think we need to try. That we're going to have as your closing line, I'm afraid, Mr. Secretary, because Thank I you. need to move us along. We have about 15 minutes left on this topic. Thanks for coming in. And Thank you. And we'll look forward to your uh, additional testimony. Uh, Mr. Francis, uh, Ms. Siglowski, uh, Mr. Nichols, and Mr. Robinson, I am sorry that we are tight uh, on uh, the calendar because we have a lift for appropriations coming up at 345 with VSAC. And then we are returning to S100. And I know uh, a number of individuals have a, a pre five o'clock deadline. So I'm hoping we can get through everyone. If not, we will reschedule. So keep that in mind as you are uh, uh, giving your testimony. If you could give us new information, uh, we don't need to hear anything else if you agree with Secretary Racine, um, but new information and concerns and edits, I would say. So with that, Mr. Francis, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'm going to speak for one minute only. Um, we supported H106 as it emerged from the House, continue to support it. I think three key words are community, replicability, and innovation. And for that reason, I think a simpler bill is better. The bill that the House sent to you is pretty streamlined. The goal here is to use school districts as centers of innovation in serving communities in a holistic way. And there's a lot of ways to do that. In the House, we testified that the title of the bill should change from pilot to demonstration, uh -huh. because really what we're trying to do is induce districts to bring themselves into the community mindset, much the way sent, uh, Lieutenant Governor Racine, I didn't know what to call him, Lieutenant Governor Racine um, spoke with you about. So my urging would be don't make uh, too many changes to the bill, if any, let it get go into play and allow school districts to respond. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very helpful. Uh, Mr. Nichols, good to oh, see you. Echo, oh, echo what Senator uh, Racine, I, I call him Senator Racine, what Senator Racine said. Um, also, you know, what Jeff said, we did uh, testimony together, our organizations, along with the Vermont Council of Special Education Administrators in the House Ed. We work closely with Representative James on the bill. And I sent Jeannie earlier today our shared testimony that she can share with each of you that you can look at and see, you know, the feedback that we gave the House in relationship to the original bill as introduced, the changes they made, you know, related to that. And as Jeff said, we support the bill. And again, we, we don't think there needs to be a lot of changes. It's a demonstration project. Let's let it play out and see what happens. And again, we think it's a step in the right direction. And I'll so stop Mr. there. So, Mr. Nichols, you do have a few suggestions. The, the VPA will have a few suggestions. Is that what you're saying? No, I don't think no. we, no. Okay. Okay. I think if the way it is right now, we would be happy with it being implemented the way that it is right now. Okay, terrific. Ms. Siglowski, good to see you. Thank you very much. Uh, we also support the bill as passed by the House, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Mr. Robinson. Good to see everybody. Colin Robinson from Vermont NEA. It's been a while since I've been here. Um, so very excited that you all are uh, taking up this bill. We've been working with Representative James since back in the fall of 2019 on this concept. Um, and our members have been deeply engaged in trying to figure out how to support students' social and emotional health for, for a long time. So there are a couple specific um, adjustments that we think would be useful um, to consider and encourage and hope that um, your committee would look at. One is recognizing, kind of zooming back, the community schools model is a national model. There are about 5,000 community schools across the nation. And there are specific things that have been shown to 
be effective and really critical for the success that um, uh, that we that we know that we all want in this demonstration project. And part of that's really centering it in community. So one that's already in the bill is having a dedicated person to do this work, the community schools coordinator. One thing that um, was in the original bill is introduced, um, but uh, was streamlined out of it that we think would actually be critical to put back in is some type of site-based leadership team or school-based leadership team. The idea here is that that is a team of parents, students, community members, other stakeholders, local agencies, um, that the community schools coordinator be working with to develop the plan that's going to be best for their community. I think as, as Jeff Francis just pointed out, um, what is the part of the promise and excitement of this model is that no one community school is the same because they are responsive to the needs of the students and communities in which they reside, right? And in order for community schools director or coordinator to come up with that plan effectively and have deep community buy-in both within the school building as well as outside the school building. Having um, a site-based or uh, leadership team established that has a broad cross-section of the community is really, we think, integral to add back in. Um, so my written testimony has some specific recommendations about uh, a definition and where that could be included, specifically including it in um, section 3D, one and A around grant uses and ensuring that the community schools coordinator works with the, the team um, that is defined in my testimony in the development and execu execution of these demonstration pilots. Um, so that would be the one, one very specific recommendation. The second one is about sort of a needs and asset assessment. And this is also another one of those components of the community schools model that is critical to the sort of fidelity as well as making sure that it actually is re reflective of the needs of the community. Um, so that would be something that could also go into the use of grant funding section, section 3D and specifically one in, um, and making sure that there is a needs assessment done in order and before um, the sort of project, I don't wanna say before the project begins, but as the project is beginning, as a deep part of, uh, of the planning process as this is deployed into the school districts that are choosing to apply for this program. Um, and so, and I specifically mentioned in 1D because in one, uh, in sorry, D, D1, in D2, it talks about it if you're hiring a new coordinator, but in D1, it talks about if you're kind of repurposing an existing staff person. And we still think that the planning process, this sort of needs assessment process is really critical to get it right. Because if you're talking about dealing with all these complex um, issues that we're, we're talking about, having stakeholder buy-in and having that needs assessment as a basis um, is really critical, however the school district is stepping into this work. So those um, specific recommendations are outlined in my written testimony. The final thing I wanna lift up, and um, this is something I believe Representative James spoke to in, in her testimony before your committee, is um, making sure there's, there's uh, an equity lens brought into this. Obviously your committee's spoken about that in other ways and in spaces. And the community schools model nationwide has been really used as a way to make sure there are culturally relevant um, curriculum that um, issues that are impacting our BIPOC community are effectively addressed. And also, I think you heard it um, in other testimony as, as well, perhaps from Representative James, about also overlaying that in the actual application review process to make sure it's not just the communities that have the resources to put together a really great grant application, not that they might not have great need for it, but making sure that it's also um, districts and schools that are interested in stepping into this exciting, innovative work um, are able to step into it as well. So for that, I would actually encourage you to hear from the folks at um, Voices for Vermont's Children. They spoke, um, they testified briefly in house education on this. Um, and they had some recommendations that I think it would be good to, uh, for the committee to hear from. 
Finally, for a more global view, um, New Mexico just passed a law on community schools in 2019. And obviously, you know, New Mexico and Vermont are different, but there is rurality in common, common between the two. And um, there's a fellow Dave Greenberg out of New Mexico who has been deeply involved in not only the passage of the law, but also the implementation of it. And I think it might be interesting for the, the committee to hear from him. He's aware of what we're doing here in Vermont um, as, as you continue to work through this. And as uh, Lieutenant Governor, Secretary, former Senator Racine spoke to, the Learning Policy Institute is also another really, really great resource. So I know we're short on time. My specific recommendations are in my written testimony. But the top lines are we're very excited about this um, about this project to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all students so they can actually access their learning. But you would agree that it's just meeting the needs of students in the pilot program? Correct. Yes. Okay. So yes. not all of our students, but those Correct. that are get into this pilot program. Uh, questions for Mr. Robinson or others before we take... Uh, uh, pause and then move on to uh, Mr. Giles. Okay, committee, uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you to our witnesses. We'll continue on this topic uh, and may have uh, some of you back to answer additional questions, but I think it's a, a bill without a doubt that this committee is, is, is enthusiastic about and just trying to uh, and find our way and, and see if maybe we might make a few suggestions before uh, advancing it. Okay, committee, let's come back at a little, uh, let's take a five minute break. We've been at it for a while.